Hello and welcome to this edition of The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. This year marks the 50th anniversary of late U.S. President Richard Nixon's historic visit to China and his meetings with Chinese leaders Chairman Mao and Premier Zhou. How should we make sense of that historic moment 50 years on? How should we make sense of the rapprochement between Beijing and Washington? And perhaps more importantly, how can those visit, those historic moments inform and enlighten the current relations between Beijing and Washington. For that, I'm very pleased to be joined today by American diplomats, or former American diplomats, should I say, and President Richard Nixon's principal interpreter, Ambassador Chas Freeman. Ambassador Chas Freeman, thank you for joining us on The Hub on CGTN. Glad to be here. So good to see you again. I still remember two years ago when I paid a visit to you in Washington, D.C. Um, by the way, you look great. Well, it's deceptive. I'm old. <laughs> no, no, no. I wouldn't say that. Um, let's talk about a, a very old event to many of our viewers, uh, millennials. That is the 1972 visit uh, made by then president, late president Richard Nixon to China, the rapprochement between Beijing and Washington. You were President Richard Nixon's principal interpreter. You were a veteran diplomat serving in the State Department. What are your personal reflections, rather, on that historical episode? What were you, the most memorable things for you now that uh, it has been 50 years? Well, it was obviously a moment in which uh, history was about to change. Uh, it was a bold move. Uh, the United States at that time did not recognize uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, we had a relationship with the losing side in the Chinese Civil War in Taipei, and yet there was the president in Beijing, the capital of the People's Republic. Um, this was a bold move, uh, I think probably unprecedented. Uh, and uh, I was most impressed, I think, by the quality of the Chinese leaders whom we met, uh, despite the fact that China was then poor, weak, vulnerable, isolated, uh, they were very well informed, they were sophisticated, um, and they handled their country's interests effectively. I mean, it took the United States, it took Washington, it took successive U.S. administrations from uh, Truman to Eisenhower uh, to uh, Kennedy, you know, uh, to you know, others uh, more than 30 years, in fact, 30 years exactly, for Washington to shift recognition from uh, the so-called Republic of China on Taipei to the People's Republic. Um, why do you think it took so long? Well, there were many reasons. Um, if the Korean War had not happened, uh, I think there would not have been that delay. Um, it was the attempt by Pyongyang to unify Korea under its uh, rule uh, that led the United States to intervene in the Taiwan Strait, uh, thus preserving the forces of Chiang Kai-shek, who otherwise would have, I think, been rather quickly um, uh, defeated, uh, even in Taiwan, by the People's Liberation Army. Um, and then uh, we got into the Cold War. Uh, China leaned to one side the side of the Soviet Union for about 10 years before it had a falling out with the Soviet Union. Um, at that point, uh, the logic was clear. Um, there were three uh, major powers, uh, the United States, China, Soviet Union. China was between the United States and the Soviet Union. It had been aligned with the Soviet Union, now it was not. And I thought the United States would have to reach out to China and that's one of the reasons I joined our diplomatic service. I wanted to be there when it happened. And much to my own surprise, I was. Well, you know, when talking about establishing relations with People's Republic of China, then French President uh, Charles de Gaulle said this, and I quote, it was the weight of evidence and reason that made him make the decision to uh, establish, to recognize People's Republic. Uh, over uh, the regime on the other side of the Taiwan Strait. How would you describe Richard Nixon and uh, you know, the administration of Richard Nixon's calculation 
on establishing relations with PRC? Was it geopoliticking against the Soviet Union? Uh, why? I think it was very simple. Um, Nixon had a very flawed character, which ultimately brought him down with Watergate. But he was a statesman. He understood statecraft, as did Mao Zedong. So in uh, the 1960s, late 1960s, uh, China and the Soviet Union began to fight battles on your borders. And there was a great concern uh, after the Soviets approached the United States with the request that we join them in putting China down, as it were. There was a great concern that China would be removed from the global chessboard uh, by invasion from Russia or uh, possibly a um, humiliation of some sort. And Nixon saw that this would fundamentally change the geopolitical picture to our grave disadvantage. And so he decided that he should do what he could to buttress China and Chinese independence. And it no longer made sense in, under those circumstances to uh, fail to establish relations with Beijing. So that was the explanation. It was very cynical. It was very cold hearted. Uh, no one knew uh, what, would, what it would produce, um, which was quite extraordinary. Let's talk about Taiwan, a very important question, Ambassador Freeman. We know that uh, ostensibly the three communique uh, resolved the issue of Taiwan with each uh, successive communique uh, having clearer uh, definitions of what the United States recognizes or acknowledges uh, with the final communique in the 1980s uh, explicitly saying that uh, the United States uh, recognizes that uh, Taiwan is a part of the People's Republic of China. But then came the Taiwan Relations Act, a very important piece of American domestic legislation, which um, to uh, you know, the, the, the perspective of many uh, experts override uh, many articles of the uh, three communique uh, in spirit, if not in letter. How do you look at this question? Well, the United States and China in 1972 in the Shanghai communique found a way of setting aside the Taiwan question so that we could focus on uh, the common interests we had and, and pursue those. Uh, in 1979, seven years later, uh, we actually established diplomatic relations. Um, that required the United States to adjust its relationship with Taiwan and diplomatic recognition, remove military forces, and set aside uh, the defense treaty we had with Taiwan. All of those things we did. The Taiwan Relations Act was necessary to sustain an unofficial relationship with Taiwan. Um, normally, uh, uh, relationships between countries depend on a legal framework, which was no longer there. Uh, so uh, that was the purpose of it. The Congress um, added a, a preamble to it, uh, which uh, stated a policy that was not the same as that of President Carter. Uh, so uh, that has been a complication in the relationship. Uh, we got into an argument shortly after the election of Ronald Reagan over arms sales to Taiwan. Uh, that was that issue was not resolved, but uh, set on a course to resolution uh, in the Bai Chi Gong Bao, the August 17 communique of 1982. Um, since then, uh, many things have happened. Uh, and uh, the finesse, if you will, the setting aside of the Taiwan question that we achieved uh, has been largely undone. So the issue is now back as a point of contention and a possible casus belli, possible impetus for armed conflict. It is a very dangerous issue that both sides need to handle carefully, as we have done for the past 40 some years, uh, and as we are not doing now. Ambassador Freeman, do you think politicians such as uh, former uh, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo and former President Trump 
Navarro and the like were playing with fire uh, when they proposed uh, such legislations as the Taipei Act, the Taiwan Travel Act, which basically uh, you know, run a contradiction to what the three communique had stipulated. Um, I am not an admirer of uh, Mike Pompeo's diplomacy. Uh, he is more a wolf warrior than the wolf warrior diplomats in, in Beijing. Uh, and uh, I think this has had a very damaging effect on U.S. prestige and influence uh, internationally. On the Taiwan question, um, I think uh, it's true. Um, uh, much of what uh, the Trump administration did uh, aggravated the question. It made it more dangerous. Um, it did depart from previous understandings. Uh, it has been called salami slicing uh, without, uh, and that is uh, probably justified. Um, so uh, there are many things that have happened to make the Taiwan issue more dangerous. Well, one is opinion on the island, which has shifted. Another uh, is uh, the uh, collapse or the erosion of the understandings we had to manage the issue which is not being managed effectively at the moment. And then how do you think Washington and Beijing should fix this issue as Taiwan is quickly becoming a very hot button issue facing you know, statesmen and politicians on both sides of the Taiwan Strait and also for those in Beijing and Washington? I think that uh, we need to do a couple of things. First, we need to re restore respectful dialogue um, one gains nothing by insulting another party with which one disagrees. Uh, and the second, I think we need to focus on our broad and uh, most important national interests, uh, which dictate cooperation between the United States and China, uh, not pursue um, a, a course that could lead to conflict, including a nuclear exchange. Uh, which is what the Taiwan issue has the potential to do. Uh, with regard to Taiwan, um, I'm afraid I am in a very small minority. Uh, I strongly favor policies by the United States that would encourage a productive dialogue across the strait and some kind of accommodation between the Chinese in Taiwan and the Chinese on the mainland. Uh, I don't think our current policies have that effect. Uh, and uh, therefore, I have grave doubts about them. Ambassador Freeman, now looking back at uh, late President Richard Nixon's visit, his historic meetings with uh, Premier Zhou and uh, uh, Chairman Mao, um, how would you assess the historic uh, legacy of the three communiques? Because some say they were masterpieces of strategic ambiguity, those three communiques and the process of rapprochement that they represent benefited both China and the United States, as well as the world, enormously. Uh, if you imagine, for example, that Nixon had not reached out to China in 1971 and 72, if Mao Zedong had rebuffed his uh, effort to uh, encourage, to encourage a better relationship with China. What would the world look like? And China in 1972 was isolated, poor, vulnerable, and it was in the midst of the Cultural Revolution. The opening to the United States had a great deal to do with China finally finding a reliable path to restored wealth and power. And it had a great deal to do with ending the Cold War and producing a world of greater prosperity and stability. Uh, so I think this was a process that yielded major benefits, not just for Chinese and Americans, but for everyone else. And uh, I, I, I think the authors of it, uh, President Nixon, Mao Zedong, whatever you may think about them in other contexts, deserve a great deal of praise for what they did. You know, I would like to draw the analogy uh, between uh, then U.S.-China dynamics uh, and the current U.S.-China dynamics. Uh, you know, many say Washington and Beijing are experiencing a new Cold War uh, initiated largely by the Trump administration. 
Uh, and then the two countries were in the actual Cold War. They were at the height of the Cold War when Richard Nixon visited. And uh, if you think about the two situations, um, the U.S. Uh, Republican administration faced a huge domestic opposition. They faced uh, the prevalent ideology of the land, that is anti-communism. And now they still face, uh, the Biden administration still faced domestic opposition and uh, the remnants of anti-communism, if you will. Uh, why can't Biden be another Richard Nixon to you know, foster a new type of major power relations with Beijing? Well, I don't know whether he wants to be another Richard Nixon or not, um, but um, I don't think he can be because uh, the American political situation at the moment is one of gridlock. Uh, there is an impasse. Uh, all three branches of government uh, have lost a good deal of their legitimacy. Uh, it's very hard for the system now to produce decisions. Um, Biden does not have a majority uh, as such in either the Senate or the House that he can rely upon. Um, therefore, he is trapped. Uh, he is trapped in the continuation of the Trump policies, uh, not just because he has people working for him who believe in those policies, which he does, uh, but because um, to deviate from those policies would be to generate opposition politically that he can't afford. Um, you know, I think the situation in 1972 and now is quite different. Um, 1972, uh, we faced a very clear, concrete, identifiable, short-term threat, uh, which was a Soviet attack on China. But now we face issues which, in my mind, are much more important. Climate change, nuclear proliferation, pandemic management. But these are not, uh, these are abstract. These are long-term, not short-term. Uh, they require a different response. Uh, and unfortunately, human beings tend to be quite short-sighted. Um, it is the rare person who, like Nixon in 1972, sees the need for a move, a risky move, a gamble, uh, to support long-term benefits. Uh, so uh, this is a different situation, and uh, I'm not looking for a short-term improvement in what I think is a very bad relationship that is not going to get better in the short term. So what about in the medium uh, and long term uh, when you think about the China-U.S. relations? Of course, in the long term, um, the common interests that I mentioned, um, uh, whether they're climate change, pandemic management, uh, non-proliferation, specific foreign policy issues, uh, the management of the global economy to produce common prosperity, all of these things require cooperation between the two uh, largest economies, the two most powerful countries on the planet. So um, I, in the long term, I think we will be, dic as you mentioned, Charles de Gaulle in France in 1964 saying that um, uh, the lo logic and reason compelled cooperation with China. Uh, I think logic and reason will compel cooperation between China and the United States. Uh, but we have to get from here to there. Uh, and I'm afraid it's going to be a bumpy road. Right. Ambassador Freeman, 10 years ago, you wrote a book called Interesting Times, China, America, and the Shifting Balance of Prestige. And you asked the question, will China rule the world as the United States once did? What will be your answers or answer now that we're in 2022? Uh, I don't think China wants to rule the world the way the United States once did. And I think actually, if you look at American history, many Americans uh, don't really want to maintain the level of responsibility for global affairs that we now have. For 150 years after our independence, we avoided ent entangling alliances and stayed on our side of the Atlantic and the Pacific for the most part. Uh, World War II drew us into a position of global leadership that we did not seek. And since then, we have, that's 75 years now, we have been in that position. 
Uh, I think there's a lot of debate in the United States uh, about whether continuing to exercise uh, that sort of responsibility globally is in our interest. I don't see many people in China who want to take on those burdens. I think China is correctly concerned mostly with its own affairs, its domestic tranquility, its progress, uh, its uh, ability to uh, defend itself. Uh, I think the United States was historically similar, and I would like to see us return to our original posture. Right. In the first decade of the 21st century, um, the United States uh, put terrorism as its n n enemy number one, uh, and uh, many would say uh, rightly so. And then for the second decade, uh, I became a correspondent based in D.C., and I remember uh, very well uh, then-President uh, Barack Obama uh, placed a pivoting to Asia or rebalancing to Asia as, is, uh, as at the center of its uh, foreign policy. Um, what would you say is the biggest national security threat or risk for the United States? And do you think the Joe Biden administration is correctly identifying them as such? Um, that's a very difficult question. Um, my answer would be that the major national security threat um, is uh, the problems in our domestic political system which threaten our democracy, our ability to make decisions on a rational basis, and so forth. If you're speaking about foreign affairs, um, we have, for reasons which escape me, uh, decided to designate both China and Russia as adversaries. And that, that has had the effect of pushing China and Russia together. Uh, it has given China and Russia a common reason, a joint reason, a shared reason, if you will, uh, to uh, oppose the United States. I don't think this is wise. Um, and uh, I think we can see now uh, with the crisis in Eastern Europe uh, that um, uh, there needs to be some sort of adjustment uh, in the U.S.-Russian relationship. I would argue there needs to be some sort of adjustment in the U.S.-China relationship. Um, and uh, so uh, I think uh, uh, the dangers are both domestic and foreign. Now, Ambassador Freeman, looking back at uh, late President Richard Nixon's visit and his meetings with uh, Chairman Mao and Premier Zhou, how can those moments in history inform and enlighten the current policymakers in Beijing and Washington? What those meetings did was what you call in Chinese Chiu Tong Sun Yi. They set aside differences in the interest of pursuing the common ground, uh, and that succeeded. Uh, it is a good method. I would argue that the lesson is that rather than putting adversarial antagonism or competition first, we should put cooperation first. Uh, our mantra should be, we seek to cooperate with each other. There are issues where we will compete fiercely. And some issues we simply don't agree about, and we will be on opposite sides. But our emphasis is on benefiting our own people, mutually beneficially pursuing common interests. That is the lesson of 1972. Okay, finally, Ambassador Freeman, now we're seeing the Beijing Winter Olympics. Um, what do you think of these games? Have you been watching any of those? You know, I have a television, but I don't plug it in because I use it only to watch films. Um, so after the fact, I can go on the internet and see portions of the games, which have been spectacular. Um, I think it's a measure of the, our times uh, first, that uh, these games are taking place in Beijing, which is, you know, was once an isolated capital, is now one of the most important cities on the planet, and everybody recognizes that. And second, uh, you can't have games now without uh, political ruckus uh, from somebody or other. Uh, so we're seeing uh, a successful staging of games in Beijing, but we're also seeing uh, the use of those games for political purposes uh, by various uh, 
special interests abroad. Thank you very much, Ambassador Chasperman. Great to have you with us. My pleasure. Nice to see you again. That was Ambassador Chas Freeman. And that will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. I'm Wang Guanin in Beijing. Thank you for watching.